Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Homutso Malele, and I am a business science student at the University of Cape Town majoring in finance and accounting. And today I'm going to be talking to you about youth apathy, or rather the lack of involvement and interest by the youth in matters of general importance to their community and society at large. But before I delve into my, my, my talk today, I would like to just give you a brief background on me and the journey that I've traveled as a young leader thus far. Um, I'm from a small town called Pretoria. I grew up in various neighborhoods. Um, it's a small town, look it up. But I grew up in, in various neighborhoods in Pretoria, but, I, but I'm Gauteng, born and raised. And the first time I'd left the borders of my home province was when I came to the University of Cape Town to study here. And when I left, I remember I told myself three things as I got onto the plane. The first thing was, wherever the plane stops, get off. <laughs> The second was, once off the plane, just follow the masses. And then the last one was, whatever happens, do not look confused and like you don't know where you're going or what you're doing. And this at the time was my toolbox of wisdom. I, I, was, I, I was in that point where I really just really wanted to get involved. And now August and September at UCT, for those of you that don't know, is what we term election season. From residences and societies, clubs, right up until the highest governance structure, the SRC, bunch of elections going through. So there's this kind of, you know, complete leadership overhaul. And it's a very exciting time, a whole lot of incoming and outgoing. And in 2010, there was no different. August, September came, and it was time to elect a new house committee at Grush and Michelle Hall, um, a UST residence where I was living at the time. And I was helping a bunch of my friends with their campaigns and so forth, and I got to hear a lot of motivations and manifestos about why people wanted to run for house comp. And it was quite interesting. And at the time, I couldn't help but think that I could do better that I had more to bring to the table. At the time, there'd been a lot of critique, um, you know, from various individuals in the house about, you know, uh, the, the house committee at the time and the governance structures and management and so forth. And it was quite funny to see that all those people who were co complaining throughout um, the year, now that the opportunity to do something about that had come, they'd not much rather sit down and complain about the election process and who's running and so on and so forth. And I'd gotten very tired of this whole couch complaining mentality, where you're complaining about how dirty the room is while sitting on the couch, as opposed to getting up and doing something about this dirty room. And I didn't want to be part of this demographic, this statistic, this couch complaining statistic. So one day I remember I got back to my room after dinner, and I sat down in my room and I was mulling all this stuff over, and I decided then and there that I'm going to run for house car, that I've got something to offer and I can do more. And at the time, I didn't know what I was going to do, what portfolio I wanted. I just knew that I had to do something, that I had something to offer. And so I ran, I got in, and the more I got involved, the more I realized how much I want to get more involved. The more I did, the more I wanted to do. But more importantly, the more I did, the more I realized how much still needs to be done, how much ground we still have to break. And at times, I spent you know, more time in, in boardroom meetings than I did in lecture theaters. And it wasn't easy as I moved myself up this leadership ladder at UCT. And today I find myself in this amazing and just humbling position to be able to give a talk at TEDx UCT. And this is, in a very brief nutshell, kind of the journey that I've traveled over the last four years. But it leads me very nicely into the crux of my talk today, that, that the youth has gotten too comfortable with this whole uh, couch complaining paradigm, where we don't want to serve and we just want to be served. We've gotten too comfortable with blaming our elders for past mistakes, past injustices, and past wrongs. And we, we're trying to tie their past with our present and our future, and asking them the what, the who, the why, the when, throwing it all up into one ball, wrapping it up, tossing it by their doorsteps, and saying, well, what now? What are you going to do to fix this? We've gotten too comfortable with singing this whole, they have failed us, little tune that we're singing. But we have to realize that if we are going to say that we've been failed by their elders, then they can turn back to their elders, their generational predecessors, and say, well, you guys failed us too. Because the truth is, if they have failed us, then they too were failed by their elders. And so, if we're going to use this whole they have failed us argument to try and explain away youth apathy, then we can explain away their mistakes by saying that they were failed by their elders. And so we can continue on this whole, you know, generational turned centennial blame game journey. 
And maybe if we went back far enough, we could actually find that one generation to pin all the blame on and say, yeah, it was you guys who messed up, then everything was a domino effect after you guys. It's your fault. But the fact remains that they too were filled by their elders. And the fact remains that the power to change the world lies in the hands of the youth. And when I talk about change, I'm not talking about policy and politics and re regulations or legislation. I'm talking about those initial first impression-like actions, those steps, those movements, those ideas that can start a group of people or society or a community onto a path of change. That power is and will always be in the hands of the youth. Now, I recently... Um, read and um, watched a video interview actually with the lady by the name of Zaman Blogu, who works with the Youth Lab, um, a youth organization. And she was talking about youth apathy versus youth frustration and how the youth isn't exactly apathetic, but more, you know, frustrated. And I agree, <laughs> the youth is immensely frustrated to the point of paralyzing indifference. I mean, we are the information generation and this is the information age. There's just too much out there, too much coming at us at too fast a pace and too high a velocity, and, we, and, and it's overwhelming. I mean, there's, there's, there, there's issues that we're dealing with and battles we still need to fight. There's poverty and unemployment, there's, there's famine, there's genocide, there's war, there's, there's civil war. There's, there are people dying of things human beings in the 21st century should not be dying of. And then, of course, there's, you know, the, the social pressure to keep up with the Kardashians, as well as, you know, to live vicariously through the characters of Jersey Shore, which admittedly takes up quite a large percentage of our time. But if the issue is this, that although one, to a certain extent, can understand and explain youth apathy, one cannot, under any circumstances, excuse or condone it. If you, you look at history, you'll see that there's this general trend where you notice that the world was not, it, well, it wasn't middle-aged men and women who were changing the world. It, was, it wasn't middle-aged men and women who were bringing those initial first impression-like actions and ideas that have changed the world or started people on that path to change. It was 20 and 30 year olds a lot like myself, a lot like my peers, a lot like you guys sitting in this very room. And just to mention a couple of examples, actually, you know, one, when, when one talks about history, one must be actually able to back that history up. Um, a couple of things that when I was, you know, looking at, 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 at uh, historical events that stood out for me was the Columbia University uh, protest in April 1968, where, where students took to the streets and they protested against um, the, the, the American government's involvement in the Vietnam War, which today one would, be able to, one would maybe liken to, to America and Iraq, maybe. Um, the other was the, the protest in Mexico City in October 1968 where high school teenagers and university students took to the streets and they were protesting against the suppression of independent labor unions as well as economic suppression. Another example is the Southern Illinois University protests um, where students were protesting against the, the uh, Vietnam War and racism on campus. Um, the Kent State University shootings where students are protesting against the American invasion of Cambodia. Today, one would be, would be able to maybe liken that to America and in Syria and how that's going to play out. Um, you talk about the, the, the protest in April, June 19, uh, 1989, where students were protesting against the lack of career prospects, government corruption, and inflation. I think a lot of us in this very room and in, and in this country can relate to those issues. But... Then, of course, there's the Iranian protest. This is also one of my personal favorites, where they were protesting against the, the closure of the uh, reformist newspaper, Salam, which, for interest's sake, uh, was being closed down by the Iranian judiciary, which at the time were very against the, the, the uh, um, liberalist views of the then president, Mohammed Khatami. But, um, and then, I mean, there were various other societies, the Student Democratic Society, um, uh, you know, the liberation movement and a lot of other things that, I'm, that, that one could actually look at history and be able to point and say, it was the youth that, that, that was changing the world. But my personal favorite, as I'm watching the clock, my personal favorite is June 16, 1976, a day known to all South Africans as Youth Day, where high school students, teenagers, like my little sister, took to the streets and were protesting 
against the Bantu education policies that were now going to make Afrikaans the language of instruction in school. A language, by the way, most of the teachers could not actually speak. But now, realize this, that they weren't protesting against the, the mediocre and inferior education that they, were, that, that, that they were receiving at the time, but rather they were saying that over and above this mediocre and inferior education, now it's being given to us in, in a language foreign to us, Afrikaans. And so it was as if they, they drew a line in the sand and said, well, now the line has been crossed and it's time to act. And so they acted, they took to the streets. And I mean, the, the, that day was, was, was amazingly symbolic. In fact, BBC uh, Radio 4 have, have a, a range of interviews and, and a documentary titled June 16, 1960, uh, 1976, The Day Apartheid Died. Now we all know, of course, that you know, Apartheid didn't die in 1976. It was years after that. But that day was ridiculously and amazingly symbolic. It ushered in country, country-wide protests that the Apartheid government could actually not handle, that the police force could not handle. Those were you know, 17 and 18 and 15 and 16-year-olds that started that. I read an article also titled uh, June 16, 1976, the day apart they died, by, uh, written by a lady um, uh, by the name of Lauren Hudson, who's a researcher in, um, uh, uh, a, well, a history researcher, I think it is. But she actually said that, one, two things to note, actually, that the events of that day, actually, were so symbolic that it was, it, it, it was as if they revived the, the liberation movement in South Africa at the time. And she then goes on to describe the events of that day as a watershed moment in South African history. Again, I note, these were high school students that we're talking about. Now, as I walk into my conclusion, I want us to note that these examples that I've mentioned, these students were protesting and they, and they were fighting on issues that were both national and international. And that I, I, I sometimes ask myself that if 20 and 30 year olds in those conservative, non-liberal, non-democratic, do as you're told, follow and respect your elders' days, could do so much with so little, what then is stopping 20 year olds and 30 year olds like myself today? See, back in those days, the only way you could get people to listen to you was to organize a protest or a sit-in, or a lockdown, or a march of some sort, and basically shut the university and the city down. But today we've got other resources. There's so many other ways we can act, so many other things we can do, so many other resources we can use. They, they don't have Facebook, and Twitter, and YouTube, and MySpace, and the World Wide Web. We have all these other e-resources that create e-platforms that we can use. And so, as, as, as I, you know, last couple of words that I really, if you forget everything else and you remember nothing today about what I've said, is that it is time that the youth own that power. The power that is innate in us being the youth. Time we own it, time we accept it, the power that comes with that and the responsibility. It's time we start getting involved, start engaging. It's time that we own that power that can bring those kind of revolutions, that can start people on that kind of change. But one will ask that, you know, with all the resources, all, 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 all the e-platforms we have, what is stopping us? And I still stand by my statement that our apathy remains our greatest stumbling block. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You've been amazing. <laughs>